Hello, and welcome to Worship with Portage United Church of Christ here in Portage, Michigan. This is worship for the week of August 20th, 2023. And I'm the Reverend Mary Kay Schooneman, the senior pastor here at PUCC, and I am happy to have you join us in our online worship service. We're continuing this week in our worship series called Sabbath as Resistance. And this week, our scripture invites us to focus on how keeping the Sabbath, honoring the Sabbath and keeping it holy can help us resist the forces of fear that lead us to be exclusive and to have excluding practices, both in our worship life and in our community life. Our sermon today is going to be a little bit unique in that it is a panel of four people, members of our congregation, one of them being my associate and co-pastor, Reverend Mac Kneebone, as well as three other lay members of our congregation. These four folks are going to share a little bit of their thoughts and reflections on the struggles of keeping Sabbath, finding a day for prayer and play, the challenges of it, and their hopes for the possibilities of having a regular Sabbath practice. Now, unfortunately, we had a bit of a gaffe in the taping of our worship today, and we did not get the entire panel conversation video recorded to show you today, but we do have the audio for it, and we'll be including some images to look at and to focus your imagination as we have this conversation about Sabbath keeping. I hope it'll still be meaningful, perhaps more meaningful, meaningful for you, if all you have to do is listen and reflect. It was a great discussion that we had in our worship, and we really want to share that with you as our online community. So I invite you now to gather yourself together, wherever you are on this big, beautiful planet, whatever day of the week it is, and wherever you might be on your own faith journey, on your own Sabbath-keeping journey. Gather yourself in and take a deep breath in and out with me. Be present with your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions, and let us prepare our hearts and our minds, our bodies, and our spirits for this worship moment. From the bustle of the world and the silence of our wilderness, we pause together for worship. At times, we can be a grumbling people, quick to focus on the lack and the gaps. Yet in love, God, you listen to our cries and provide for us. Impatiently, we are a searching people, craving peace and purpose. And with patience, God, you offer us hope and sustain us. Help us to be a thankful people, recognizing your love for us in all its abundance. Through your presence, God, you turn us toward you and nourish us. In this time of worship, let us open our hearts and be filled. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, gathered here in one strong body, gathered here in the struggle and the power, spirit draw near. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, gathered here in one strong body, gathered here in the struggle and the power, Spirit draw near, gathered here in the mystery of the hour, gathered here in one strong body, gathered here in the struggle of the heart, spirit draw near, gathered here in the mystery of the hour, 
gathered here in one strong body, gathered here in struggle of the body, gathered here in struggle of the body, gathered here in struggle of the body. Please pray with me in the opening prayer. Holy One of Israel, in a culture characterized by restless anxiety, we are indeed weary and heavy laden. Teach us about Sabbath rest. Give us a new understanding of how that gift can free us from our commodity-driven existence into the life of neighborly relationship. In the name of the one who calls us to take his yoke upon us, where we can find rest, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Today's scripture is Psalm 67. Be gracious to us, O God, and bless us. Let your creative radiance light our way and warm our inmost being. As your ways are made known in the earth, as all the nations learn of your saving works, let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let them shout with joy, for you judge the nations with fairness and guide the peoples of the earth. 
Let the people praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth was made an offering of its produce. You continue to bless us, O God, our God. May God bless us and be held in holy awe to all the ends of the earth. All right, so here's a little context to our reading from Isaiah chapter 56. He's writing this in a time after Israel and its temple had been destroyed and all the people of Jerusalem had been taken into exile in Babylon, or at least most of the people. And so now, many generations later, some of the faithful people who'd been taken into exile in Babylon have returned to Jerusalem to rebuild. And their overarching questions, as they have now returned after some 70 or 80 years, are things like this. Are we still God's people? Have all those decades that we were in Babylon reshaped who we are, what our identity is, what our values are, what our worldview is. And they wonder, who are we now? And of course, complicating all of this is the fact that some people were left behind in Jerusalem and remained there, even as a whole bunch of people were in exile in Babylon. So it's a really shifting, mixed up time that they are in. As the people are trying to reestablish themselves, they feel like their very identity is at stake. If indeed God allowed the people to be conquered because they were disobedient to the covenant, now more than ever is the time to double down on following the rules and proving that they are indeed God's chosen people. So some of the voices that are prevalent and are recorded in scripture in books like from the prophet Ezra and the prophet Nehemiah, some of the voices are saying things like marriages to foreign wives have to be dissolved and these foreign wives must not be a part of Jerusalem. Because things like that were after all written in the original covenant that Moses shared with the people. Foreigners were to be excluded, eunuchs were to be excluded. Many folks were arguing that the true identity of the people returning to Israel could only be found in separating themselves from all things foreign. Now, we would judge them, I'm guessing, pretty harshly for such a severe perspective. But we have to see and understand how vulnerable these folks must have felt after being attacked and conquered. Suspicion of outsiders was probably pretty natural. And welcoming these outsiders could be seen as a betrayal to all that they had experienced and suffered while they were in Babylon. So into these fears and anxieties from the prophet Isaiah, speaking the words of God. Don't let the immigrant who has joined with the Lord say, the Lord will exclude me from the people. And don't let the eunuch say, I'm just a dry tree. The Lord says to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, choose what I desire and remain loyal to my covenant. In my temple and courts, I will give them a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an enduring name that won't be removed. The immigrants who have joined me, serving me and loving my name, becoming my servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath without making it impure, and those who hold fast to my covenant, I will bring them to my holy mountain and bring them joy in my house of prayer. I will accept their entirely burned offerings and sacrifices on my altar. My house will be known as a house of prayer for all people, says the Lord God, who gathers Israel's outcasts. I will gather still others to those I have already gathered. 
Now, it's important to note that God is not just asking for a kumbaya moment where everybody gets along for an hour on a Sunday morning. The people that God is saying are now welcomed are people that were not welcomed according to the covenant with Moses. God is contradicting what Moses established in Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Moses stipulated that certain foreigners were not welcome and eunuchs were not welcome. And just to clarify, eunuchs were men whose genitals had been altered, their testicles removed, and then they were frequently uh, served as servants in harems. They were used as slaves, and sometimes they were used as sex slaves for males in whatever conquering um, nation got them. Um, and this, by the way, is the type of male and male sexual relationship that Paul refers to in Romans, these kind of abusive and unequal power, power relationships. So just to clarify, that's who eunuchs are. And those are people that Moses said were not welcome in the covenant. And now God is contradicting that. So this is going to be a real shock for the people. This is not kumbaya. This is going to be a frightening and challenging welcome for people to live into. Now just stop and think a minute about the fears that get expressed in our U.S. culture to these days. They're very similar, if you think about it. The problem with America is that we have strayed from our traditional values. Anybody hear that? Right? The problem with America is that we are not following God's way. Anybody hear that one? Right. And we were hearing these kinds of things for many years now, but we're really hearing it now. So a lot of us, it makes a lot of us unsure and uncertain, and we hunker down in fear. So with these words that we just heard from Isaiah, and thinking about some of the stuff we've talked about the last couple of weeks, um, we're going to have this conversation now. Um, Mac and I decided it would be a good opportunity for a few people in the congregation to maybe speak about their reflections on Sabbath, their own kind of challenges that they face in keeping a Sabbath. It'll also be a time if any of you have comments or questions, we invite those as well. But I want to ask you to think about, reflect on how the way fears in our culture within ourselves shape our interactions with people in the world. How they shape our willingness to welcome and celebrate people that we have been trained or taught to avoid or to be leery or afraid of. Because that is a very cultural norm that gets set. Consider how remembering the Sabbath and keeping it holy could be the key for overcoming our fears that lead us to exclude. So um, for those of you who don't know, <laughs> our panel members are Cindy Seamark, who is in our, well, she does a lot of stuff. <laughs> so Cindy Seamark, Dale Pierbolt, Mac Kneebone, our associate pastor, and Kristen Smith, who is our moderator. Um, I told her that goes with the job of being moderator. You now have to <laughs> speak on panels and things like this. So I guess the first thing that I'm going to ask each of you to speak to is to share your reflections on what we've been hearing about, both in the scriptures and what we've been talking about when it comes to the fourth commandment. Um, and then I gave everybody an article by Eugene Peterson called um, Confessions of a Former Sabbath, Bre Former Sabbath Breaker. And I know some of you have read it, but not everybody. But they were assigned <laughs> to read it as well as some other things. So um, I'd like to ask what your ahas were anything that kind of went, oh, wow, or anything that kind of made you go, ooh, <laughs> not so sure about that. So if you all would just take a few moments and share that. And then if anybody like wants to speak up, just kind of flag us down and we'll bring a mic to you too. I've got a mic that I can run and, uh, well, or walk briskly <laughs> anyway. <laughs> all right, Cindy, why don't you go first? Okay. 
I love the descriptive, descriptive language Eugene Peterson uses in his article that Mary Kay just mentioned. When he writes, there are many questions who tell stories of childhood Sundays corseted with whalebone prohibitions. Can't you feel the squeeze? <laughs> yeah. So I smile, and I think not just about Sundays, but my whole childhood, actually. Every day growing up with puritanical prohibitions. Sundays um, were not as hard because when I was growing up, and you, a lot of you remember, there, you, know, you couldn't go to a restaurant, you, stores were closed, so if it's about not spending money, that was pretty easy. Hmm. <laughs> so it didn't seem too bad. I was happy to play out in the backyard or read a book after being stuffed with mom's delicious roast dinner. And the rest of the week, though, could be problematic. But since this is about Sabbath, um, the prohibitions back then seemed largely to be centered around commerce. Don't spend money, of course, give to the church offering. Uh, so how did it happen when the stores and restaurants stopped closing? Many church people flocked to them on Sundays. So what does that say about Sabbath keeping? I'm not sure. But in adulthood, I still sense that specialness of Sunday, and I don't schedule it much beyond worship but it's easier to not overdo because I'm retired now, so that plays into it, too. I don't have to do a lot of work for the week coming up. My thoughts for keeping the Sabbath. I was raised in the conservative town of Holland, Michigan, in a family with conservative values reflecting their Dutch heritage. I attended a conservative Christian Reformed church I went to conservative Christian schools, you get the idea. <laughs> and among the traditions we were taught was the strict observance of the Sabbath. To us, that meant that on Sunday, one did not do any work that could have been and should have been done on other days of the week. One did not play active games or participate in activities that contradicted the expectations for Sunday, which were church attendance, quietness, contemplation, reverence, and rest. That was our definition of the Holy Sabbath. Through the years, I've learned that that set of rules and expectations, although providing a good foundation, was hardly a complete story. It implied that our religious practices were the main requirements for and the only way to get a fulfilled spiritual life. It limited Sabbath to specific observances and a specific day of the week. And it consisted of a set of don'ts without, regarding, without a corresponding set of do's. But God is bigger than that and has a way of not fitting into our structured rules. And Sabbath needs to be bigger as well. Our scripture for today reminded us that if even the stranger and the foreigner among us will be blessed by God when they observe Sabbath. So we can no longer limit the definition of Sabbath with rules that reflect our culture and our expectations. So how about this? And that's my <laughs> words up there. To observe Sabbath, I need to intentionally set aside a specific regular time for a combination of one, an attitude of worship, two, contemplating my relationships with God, family, friends, and the entire creation, and three, seeking to align my specific strengths and abilities to tasks that produce spiritual fruit. That's a mouthful. And that's not an easy task, even for retirees like me who have flexible time. It's especially difficult for those with jobs, family, or other activities that require a lot of time. But you don't have to do it all at once. You can start with a couple of minutes, then practice, 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 and let it grow. God will be pleased, and so will you. My growing up was much different. Although I was raised in a kind of conservative community and environment, I was Catholic. So we didn't have the same prohibitions on the Sabbath. Uh, really, the, the hardest thing to do was to, 
to figure out when the necessary work ended so that you didn't go on. For instance, we had to still milk the cows mm -hmm. and feed them and water them. And, you know, just because that's just right. We got to be fed, you know, so they get to they get to be taken care of as well. But we weren't supposed to do anything um, beyond the necessary. But unlike some of my um, friends in different communities of faith, we got to play cards. <laughs> <laughs> we right. got to play Catholics games. did things like that, didn't they? Yeah. They played cards. And we got to play cards <laughs> Bingo. With, with grandma, you know, and cribbage and, and canasta and all these things. And, and if we wanted to dance, we could dance. <laughs> I mean, scandalous, right? So we got to, to play however we wanted to play. But now as an adult, as a person in ministry, I have to figure out when I get those play times in a different way. And one of the questions that I found myself asking during this time of meditation, of Sabbath, and as we look forward to sabbatical time, is what's the difference between Sabbath and Sunday? Do I have to figure out how to carve out Sabbath in my Sunday in spite of the fact that I've spent a lot of work, you know, psychic work before coming in, psychic work after, you know, kind of defragging, if you will. We don't defrag our computers anymore, but most of you know what I'm talking about. Um, do I have to make Sabbath a Sunday? And the answer is no. Now, that, that's not the point of Sabbath. And when Jesus, and I'm going to try not to preach here, um, <laughs> but when Jesus says, you know, the Sabbath is made for the human, the human isn't made for the Sabbath, that gives me a little bit of guidance of how I can structure my own time of refreshing renewal um, and playtime. So much like Dale, um, I, my growing up was much like Dale's, except I was in the Reformed Church, so we could ride our bikes on Sunday, <laughs> where Dale could not. Um, but our, our stories are very similar in that. Um, but we could uh, do a little bit more play um, than what the Christian Reformers could do um, during their, t their Sunday or their Sabbath. Um, and when Mary Kay started this series a couple weeks ago, um, I thought I was doing good as a working parent um, that works a full-time job. I thought I was doing well keeping the Sabbath, carving a couple hours here and there just for me time or my time to do whatever and to sit and relax and rest. And then I found myself being challenged with that concept of just carving a couple hours here and there because every day there is something to do whether work, and then on Saturday you gotta cut the grass, and then on Sunday you gotta get ready for Monday, and then it, you know, it's do, do, do. So I thought I was doing really good with a couple hours here and there, and coming to church. Uh, and during these past couple of weeks, I've been, it, that it's been challenging. It's, it, that thinking has been challenged to say, no, you're, you need to take a day, an entire day, but how do you do that when you work and when you have a family and when you have this to do and that to do? And, you know, I was, um, during a, a majority of my working career, I worked seven days a week. You know, I, there was always something I had to do, a responsibility, responsibility I had to fulfill um, every day of the week. So taking a couple days, I thought I was, it was doing good and being able to get to church on Sunday. I was, I was keeping the Sabbath. And in this article, what really hit me about the article was this concept of play and pray. And he really pulls out um, that idea of play and pray and setting an entire day, not just a couple hours, but an entire day where you spend time in prayer or in contemplation and then playing. And playing could be anything from connecting with family, friends, connecting with nature, you know, however we decide, define that play. And so what I've been reflecting on is, is really that concept of play and pray, and not just for a couple hours, but for a day. And going back and looking at, at 
you know, what I was taught and modeled as a kid and how can I get back to that? Because it's, it was, it's easy, you know, with work and so on, it was easy to get out of that concept of taking a day, um, especially with sports and this and that. And, you know, now we can, you know, do this on Sunday and go here on Sunday or, you know, work on Sunday. Um, so that, to me, that's, that's been a, a struggle uh, these past couple of weeks as I, as I really challenged myself to think and define what it means for me to keep, a th keep that Sabbath and really carve out a day um, and not just a couple hours. Anybody want to say anything? Anybody have any thoughts? Yeah, John. Oh, wait. Yep, let's get the mic. Because then we can hopefully hold it up close because then we can hopefully hear you. Uh, yeah, that, our that would be meeting. great. Um, so one thing I noticed about the article was that it was written like 25 or 30 years ago. Yeah, 1988. And, yeah. and in that, he talked about the, the difficulty in turning his Sabbath from Sunday of work, and that's my Sabbath, to day of rest, was just the tradition. And, and, and how he just, he knew he'd get pushback because his people were stuck in what they'd been stuck in. And so we just did it. And, mm -hmm. and then people started to notice in a few years. And my entire life, the past five, has simply been change. And it's really scary at first. And, and you, you lean into it. And the, the problem is, as you lean into it, well, you lean too hard against that window and you're going to fall out. Yeah. And that's really, really scary, but, but you fall out that window a few times and you realize what's scary, was what, what's worse, is that fear of change. Yeah. The change isn't hard at all. It's the fear of change, the anxiety and the, the difficulty that you do in the, oh no, what am I going to do? What will it look like? How will it happen? I don't know how far down that floor is. I don't, just jump out the damn window. Yeah. John, I, you know, in response to that, not only the fear of change, but not, it, you know, for me, it's the fear of not doing, not being good enough, not doing enough, not being productive enough, not getting enough done. Um, so I think that has a part of it too. It's not just the change, but it's the fear of that expectation that I need to produce, I need to do something, I need to be productive. Um, and not the sloth, as, as he mentions in the article. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sloth, one of the seven deadly sins, right? Monica. Hello, everyone. So I'm just offering, for those that didn't know, I grew up Seventh-day Adventist, and so one of the pinnacles of that denomination is observing the Seventh-day Sabbath. And so every Saturday, growing up from my childhood through till the time I went to college, I observed the Seventh-day Sabbath every week. Um, and so the thing that I just wanted to add is that um, although I don't, practice that same way anymore when I do feel that I'm not being productive enough and I do feel that I'm not doing enough. I remember and draw on that experience growing up and being like, we had a whole day where we didn't do anything and that was a part of our spiritual practice and it was what everyone in my faith community was doing mm -hmm. and we were told that that was the right way to live and to do things. So I remember sometimes on Saturdays still, I will still feel some type of, you know, um, I don't know if you want to call it like sentiment or some type of relief or calm that it is Saturday and I really don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to offer that from someone that grew up with that being the center of our faith denomination. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I was not raised with the Sabbath being important, necessarily. There was never any emphasis on it. By the 90s, the Reformed Church had not started emphasizing that at all. Um, but then when I was in, well, after I started working, I was doing my grandmother's grocery shopping one day a week, working five to six days a week. So, and grocery shopping for grandma was not like two hours, it was eight. 
<laughs> yeah. Seven to eight hours. Um, and then one day, just, you know, doing Graham's grocery shopping, it all just fell apart. No clue why, you know, we were, John was with me, we were standing in the wine aisle at Harding's, and I'm just like, I can't do this anymore. At that same time, the church I was going to, they were talking about Sabbath and what that actually meant, and that it didn't just need to be Sunday to pick the day that is off for you. Mm -hmm. Particularly if you're like, if you're an introvert who works with people every day. <laughs> <laughs> and for some reason, you know, everybody likes you and has to talk to you for, you know, 10 minutes each time you, they come in. It gets a little draining, and then you have to show up at church on Sunday and look happy like you don't want to, you know, <sighs> bite the head off of the next person who steps in front of you. So just taking a time to do, like, to re actually rest mm -hmm. away from the things that cause you stress. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that was emphasized at that church was it looks different for everybody. Some people it's be out in nature, some people it's crafting, some people it's who knows what else. Mm -hmm. But, and so probably the last five years, I have set aside one day a week to actually just just to be, mm -hmm. do the thing that re-energizes you. Because as you get, had said, if you don't do that, the fruits of the spirit go away. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I think um, one of the things that I think of with um, I think it was Cindy who started it, at least, by saying that Sabbath was always kind of a bunch of don'ts. Don't do this, don't do that. And I wonder if for some of us who maybe even didn't even grow up in the CRC or the Reformed tradition or Seventh-day Adventist or whatever, um, there is still this sense of rigidity when we think about keeping the Sabbath. And I think that was one of the most powerful things in that. Uh, Eugene Peterson article where he said the Sabbath is a day to pray and to play. And someone else had commented to me that hearing that we could play on the Sabbath kind of changed their whole perspective of what it meant to keep the Sabbath, that it doesn't have to be all these don'ts, um, that we can book a movie date with a friend or book a date night with our loved one or whatever, and that that can still be Sabbath, because it is the time to step away from what stresses you out. I don't know, maybe a date night with your loved one stresses you out, but, <laughs> but nonetheless, um, the play and the pray. Um, and I don't want to keep us, we could, this was just great, just off of this one question, but one of the other questions that I think is something for all of us to think about, and maybe some of you could speak to this too, is... Um, where might we have choices to let go of things where we currently think we don't have choices? You know, the things that we, we think we have to do, do we really have to do them? What, what choices do we have? And I also find myself wondering, like Kristen, I know you commented that like one, one of your jobs in particular when you were like the AD or the assistant AD, whatever it was at K, seven days a week. What's up with employers? Right? What, you know, that it's difficult when your employer requires that of you. What's up with that? They need to, they need a lecture on Sabbath. But anyway, <laughs> um, so I don't know, do any of you have thoughts about that, about how do you make choices, or perhaps you're just struggling with making that choice, or does anybody in the congregation have thoughts about where do we have choices where we might think we don't? Well, I'll just keep it short here, but um, the creation story doesn't really specify the time span of each day, you know, day in quotes. 
And I suggest that we also keep that concept fluid and do what works for ourselves. Some of you can't take a whole day. And what works for yourself and your families, in the end, Sabbath is your quiet time for contemplation, rest, and play. That can be special moments, a whole day, or a hybrid of both. And in the end, we all need it, so each of us should craft it for our maximum benefits. That's all I have to say. That's great. <laughs> and with that, she turned off the mic. <laughs> <laughs> we, we appreciate you not dropping it. <laughs> <laughs> Any other thoughts? You know, I, I think um, choices comes down to um, unverbalized expectations and trying to distinguish our own sense of guilt and uh, responsibility um, perceived by what our employer or um, society expects of us. You know, for me, uh, my employer didn't say you have to work seven days a week, but I felt my job required me to work seven days a week, right? Um, I had a choice of, oh, I, well, not when I was the athletic trainer, I, I had to, <laughs> <laughs> because I had to do injury clinics on Sundays. But, um, you know, when I was later in life, you know, when I was the athletic director, um, I had the, I felt it, it was my responsibility um, to be there all the time for every game. So I think, you know, we have to really look at what, what is the expectation and if we say no, what is the consequence? What, what is the result? And not, um, you know, feeling guilty about that. You know, it, it's the feeling guilty about saying no, okay? I can't say no to work. Well, yeah, we, we can. Or we have a choice to say no to work and, and, and make special moments and carve out moments for us so we can be more present at work. I'll reiterate a couple of things with that. One is that it's an individual decision what we give up or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and everybody's gonna be different because mm -hmm. every situation is different and that's fine. And the other thought is that it doesn't all have to be done at once. You can mm -hmm. start small. Mm -hmm. I, I think about what's normative in your question of what's up with employers. You know, what's up with the expectations of, um, of, of communities and there is a, I think, a holding things in both hands, the individual responsibility to try to figure out how to rejuvenate yourself, right? The individual choices that we make, but also the communal support that we either give or don't give for people to relax. Uh, when I was a young person and I was working three jobs just to try to make rent and to try to eat, what Sabbath choices could I make? The expectation that I have to, um, th of, of people to make minimum wage because their job isn't worth enough money to live on, and so they have to work harder because obviously they have a character flaw, so they should work more. That's just good discipline versus the person who has the possibility of making more money and being able to work regular hours and take that Sabbath. What is wrong with the system that we live in? Now, I, I feel incredibly fortunate every single day of the privilege and the honor that I have and the position that I'm in. And it quite honestly chokes me up because I didn't know if there was ever gonna be a time when I could have kind of a normal job. And honestly, this is not a normal job. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, put that in perspective, but it's a job that I have a passion for and it's also a job that I can say I need to stop. I need to breathe. I need to have, you know, part of my job is to be um, grounded and centered so that I can be grounded and centered when you come to me ungrounded and uncentered, mm -hmm. right? So I can offer you that and others. Um, so I need to wrap this up because I could keep going on about it. But what is wrong with our system? And how can we communally support each other to remind each other you are of great intrinsic worth? 
just as you are. And if you can take some time to breathe, I support you in taking those breaths. I think that's important too. So um, thank you all, because it takes vulnerability, a willingness to be vulnerable, to sit up here and share some of your struggles in finding your way through this with this crowd of very welcoming people, not, non, very non-judgmental people, but it takes a, a great degree of vulnerability, which I will say it takes a great degree of vulnerability to practice keeping Sabbath as well, as we've said, because you have to let go of this insistence that you need to do things that your work won't last if you're not there that one day. You have to let go of this notion that if you're not there to oversee something getting done, then how can it ever get done properly and that type of thing. So it requires vulnerability to practice Sabbath. I'm gonna riff a little on something that Cindy alluded to and that came up kinda of, sorta of, in our conversation when we met. And that is if having a day where you do nothing but pray and play is like <laughs> for you, you know, perhaps it starts with an afternoon. Perhaps it starts with Sunday afternoon is my afternoon to pray and play and I'll let go of stuff. And I do believe also in the communal value. I think it cultivates within us compassion because we begin to realize what a gift this is and how many people are not able because they are working three jobs just to pay rent. And so it cultivates within us compassion and a desire for a broader justice in our community. And there's where I think also community support as we're practicing this, if there's groups of us who can get together and talk about the struggles, I think are good. A key piece of all of this is to remember where the fourth commandment is located. Right after the commandments of how we are in relationship with God, you shall have no other gods before me, you will not have false idols, like your job. <laughs> um, you will not make graven images. Oh, that's the same thing, what is it? There's no other gods before me, oh my gosh. No other gods before me, no graven images, don't take my name in vain. Um, those three, then we get the fourth commandment, and then we get the remaining commandments about how to be in community with one another. It is the linchpin between the love of God and love of neighbor. In remembering the Sabbath and keeping it holy, that is the space where we are practicing loving God and loving neighbor, and we move to a life, a community life that more fully lives in the love of God and love of neighbor. Let us pray our prayers of concern. God of the abundant enough, you are the fullness our souls long for. When we fill the space around us with the clutter of possessions or a busy calendar, when we seek isolating comfort or frenetic distraction, calm our hearts. Hold our wounded places tenderly. Release us from the fear of scarcity. Ground us in the certainty of the goodness and beauty that flow from you in abundance. O Pilgrim God, you ask us to live simply. Compassionate God, we remember those who pack lightly, not by choice, but by necessity. Refugees, the desperate poor, orphans, the abandoned, and victims of natural disasters. Move us to compassion, draw us to wisdom, and compel us to act. We seek to embody your hands, providing for the needs of others, as well as your heart, opening to strangers in hospitality. O Pilgrim God, you ask us to live simply. Our liberator, you call us into freedom, 
where we are captive to patterns, ideas, or systems that constrict the flourishing you have created for us, free us. Where we are burdened by messages and images that diminish our love of neighbor and of self, free us. Turn our whole beings to you. Gently open our hands to let go of all that weighs us down so that we may receive your joyful simplicity. O Pilgrim God, you ask us to live simply. Winnowing God, you ask us to release, let go, surrender, and yield all that we can in service of making space for what is most essential. Sustain us on the path of simplifying our lives and traveling on this earth more lightly so that we no longer live beyond what can be sustained. We pray in Jesus' name and speak the words he taught us. Our God in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us this week in our online service. I'm glad you were able to be a part of this, and I do hope you will continue to journey with us in our worship as a part of our community here at PUCC. Please feel free to reach out and send an email to either me or Pastor Mac, and let us know who you are even if you're a member of this church, let us know who you are as you worship with us. We'd love to be in contact with you. As you go into the world this week, reflecting on the possibilities of keeping a day apart as your Sabbath day, I invite you to go forth with these words of our common commission. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to what is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. And honor all people. Love and serve our God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of God who creates us in love the grace of Jesus, the one who offers us rest, and the sustenance of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and evermore. Amen. We will walk with God, my brothers. We will walk with God. With God, my sisters, we will walk with God. We will go rejoicing till the kingdom has come. We will go rejoicing till the kingdom has come. We will walk with God as family, we will walk with God. We will walk with God as family, we will walk with God. We will go rejoicing. Kingdom has come. We will go rejoicing till the kingdom has come. We will walk with God together. We will walk with God. We will walk with God together. We will walk with God. We will go rejoicing till the kingdom has come. We will go rejoicing till the kingdom has come.